Zenitsu's castle guy Crow, a sparrow named Chuntaro, flies through a dimly lit forest while carrying a piece of rolled up paper with his legs. Meanwhile, Tanjiro finally manages to push a boulder, much to the astonishment of Zenitsu and Inosuke. After briefly pausing, Tanjiro becomes more motivated to push with all his might. Inspired by this sight, Inosuke manically chants Tempura, before he successfully attempts to push his boulder. This leaves Zenitsu hiding behind a tree, who inwardly cries about being the straggler. However, the chirps of Chuntaro grab his attention and he notices the bird by his feet. He at first dismisses the sparrow and complains that he can't leave until he pushes his boulder, causing Chuntaro to harshly peck his foot. Although at first angered, he notices the paper Chuntaro brought and recognizes it as a letter for him. Shortly afterwards, Tanjiro successfully pushes the boulder one cho. However, the endeavor left him exhausted and as he is hyperventilating, he realizes that he's completely dehydrated. Fearing that he'll die, he weakly calls out for Zenitsu, Imasuke, or Murata to help as he hallucinates and sees them until Jomai pours water onto Tanjiro's mouth and desperately prays for his well-being as he responds to Jomai's surprise. He then announces that his boulder training drill is completed along with complimenting his efforts in the events that happened at the Swordsmith Village in addition, revealing that he acknowledges him for his hard decision to put the villagers' lives before his sister and claims he should be proud. Tanjiro argues Nezuko had been the one to make the decision, believing he doesn't deserve any praise but shows his gratefulness towards being rehydrated with water. To which Jomei replies saying to continue to grow stronger, no matter what anyone else says. As soon as Tanjiro questions his choice to acknowledge him, Jomei mentions his past as a teacher taking care of orphans in a temple before he joined the Demon Slayer course. Comparing his time that which he shared with the orphans as if similar to that of a happy family life despite not being related by blood in which Jomai reminisced moments of the orphans getting along well together as a supportive group. Jomai also explained how he would prefer to live the same life forever, until he reveals that one of the children was a traitor, breaking curfew, when traveling outside after nightfall as he encounters a demon result of the orphans' ignorance. In order to save himself, the traitor orphan would stretch his selfishness far enough as to offer all other orphans sleeping in the temple as sacrifices to the demon in exchange to flee and escape for his own life. At night, the orphan quietly extinguished the wisteria incense surrounding the temple before the demon came and immediately slaughtered four of the eight children before Jiomai had woken up to realize his responsibility to defend the remaining children, but noticing three orphans running at the demon and were killed, leaving Seo as the only orphan listening to his instructions, Jomai feels enraged at his failure to protect the children he cared about and repeatedly punches the demon until daybreak came. The next day, the villagers came to speak to Sayob, who struggled to describe the incident to them, when she said that the man was a monster who killed all the children and since the demon's corpse had disintegrated in the sun, everyone assumed she had been speaking of Jomi, and he was imprisoned. Jomai cries with emotions of heartbreak in his stay of imprisonment, wishing Seo to at least be thankful and grateful for his actions of fighting and protecting her out of his own care and affection he had for her, understanding she would have been thoroughly confused. Jomai mentions that he would have been sentenced to execution if it weren't for Kagaya's kind actions of intervening. He tells Tanjiro that he found other people and Hashira hard to trust when he joined the Demon Slayer course also revealing that he didn't trust Tanjiro either until he showed his true potential as he promises to help Tanjiro in the foreseeable future, to which Tanjiro also promises to continue his efforts to try his best after Jomai pats him and announces that he has completed his training. Tanjiro, Imasuke, and Jenya eat miso soup together as Jenya mentions Jomai wouldn't let him be of Subuko due to lack of talent, but allowed him to become his apprentice after learning that he ate demons along with recalling how he introduced Jenya to Shinobu when she checked his physical condition and including how she lectured him upon every visit. Suddenly, Inersu tries to steal Zenitsu's fish before Tanjiro exclaims, informing him to wait for Zenitsu to return from training to eat his fish. Tanjiro then reveals that he will soon depart to Gyu's mansion, asking if Jemya would come along to which he apprises that he can't by stating his requirement to finish Jomei's training first. Furthermore, Inosuk laughs and insults him upon hearing he can't use breathing styles, resulting in both throwing consecutive punches to each other as Tanjiro intervenes. Zenitsu's determination persists when Tanjiro heads outside and finds him still attempting to push his own boulder, worriedly mentioning his silence in past few days and asked if he would soon eat in which responding with a reminder for Tanjiro to do his best and seize his training task as a responsibility. Learning himself that his strength training is something he must prioritize his full attention on in order to do what he must do and focus on this alone with independence to maintain his enhanced strength. As Tanjiro departs to Gyu's training, he assumes how Nezuko must feel lonely without being in the care of Tanjiro with the concern that she may be weeping with tears, 
hoping that she is safe in the care of Sakanji Rokodaki. Walking up the flight of stairs to Dyu's abode, Sanemi and Jiyu can be seen repetitively sparring in an open space where they continuously use their perspective breathing techniques with Sanemi using Wind Breathing, First Form Dust Whirlwind Cutter and Fifth Form Cold Mountain Wind and Jiyu using Water Breathing, Fourth Form Striking Tide in Seventh Form Drop Ripple Thrust as Tanjiro stares on at their immense strength and haste with awe as he quickly rushes in to intervene after the clash to stop Sanemi from attempting to fight Jiu barehanded. Sanemi angrily interrupts, mentioning the factor of Tanjiro originally being forbidden to interact with him and his anger heightens due to hearing the mention of his like for Red Bean Mochi as Tanjiro assumes this to be a potential cause of their battle. Jiu then asks Sanemi if he likes that food as Tanjiro brags about its taste, causing Sanemi to punch Tanjiro upward knocking him unconscious for a short period of time before leaving with a hostile demeanor. When Tanjiro awakens, Hyu explains that the fight was intentional and part of the Hashira training, explaining how Hashira battle with each other to test their strength, in which he apologizes for interrupting the spar after learning this. Hyu also claims that through Sanami's anger, he had figured out what his favorite food really was and came up with the idea to give him some red bean mochi to apologize. Sanemi walks down a flight of stairs in the evening, aggravated by Tanjiro and Ju's behavior presented towards him. Sanemi also mentions how Obanai and Muchiro are out on training at nightfall, determined to join them again and defeat them in a spar before his thought was immediately interrupted by recalling what Tanjiro asked, envying him for being so carefree and blaming him for being the reason of his depart. He unexpectedly stops within his tracks and snatches something off of the stair in anger, questioning what it could possibly be until the object is recognized to be one of Makam's familiar eyeballs crushed by Sanami's hand, causing the eyeball to disintegrate and he assumes an active demon infiltration is ongoing within the corpse. Meanwhile, at the Ubuyashiki mansion, a main comforts Kagaya as he lays with his further worsened state but immediately recognizes an unfamiliar presence as Kagaya also senses the entrance gates opening for an infiltrator slowly approaching far away in the direction whilst remaining in his deteriorated condition. Kagaya glares over to the open doors at the direction of someone drawing near despite having bandages over his eyes and decayed skin, hearing the mysterious figure's footsteps proceeding to heavily grow closer. The clear aura begins to disperse from the ominous shadow as he stops in his tracks at the back entrance of the estate, revealing the familiar visitor confronting him to be Muzin, standing before Kagaya after he welcomes him to his abode. Muzin then remarks Kagaya's current appearance looking unsightly and hideous. That's where this video ends. You have to click on the right to see its next part. And to see best anime recap on my channel, you have to click on the left. If you liked the video, like it and subscribe to see more contents of this.